The Oblates of St. Augustine was founded by Father John Melnick, formerly a member of the Order of St. Augustine and of the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. Father John's dream was to defend and preserve the traditional Augustinian charism against the attacks from modernist bishops seeking to destroy the traditional Catholic faith and religious life. Beginning during the months in 2020, when Catholic bishops made it nearly impossible to attend Mass and receive the last rites, Father John founded the Oblates of St. Augustine to preach the traditional Catholic faith, provide the sacraments according to the traditional Roman rite, and live the traditional Augustinian religious life to merit grace for the world. Living a mendicant charism, the Oblates of St. Augustine is supported entirely by the alms of its generous benefactors. You can visit our website to learn more about how you can support this mission at www.westonmonks.org. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We live in a very hedonistic society. A very hedonistic society. And whether we mean to or not, oftentimes a lot of their habits, their perspectives, their ideas can shut off on us. We just acquire them by hanging around with them, osmosis or something. But without really knowing it, without really intending it, we tend to... Uh, soak in their perspectives and sometimes even take, take their perspective on things. One of those perspectives that we've kind of led ourselves to soak in is a perspective on suffering. A perspective on suffering. The hedonists think that suffering should be avoided at all costs. And even some were pursuing pleasures as a sort of uh, compromise with suffering. Oh, I suffer this, therefore I need to have uh, this pleasure over here to kind of even out life. Because the worst thing that could happen in life is to suffer. Because when we suffer, one of the things that we often feel ourselves, that we often feel, is a lack of control. When, my, when I lose my health, I no longer control the things I could do. I can no longer move about as I please. Or I can no longer do the things that I used to do. I lack control. Or if I'm undergoing financial problems, again, I lack control. And so, it's, it's very common that people who suffer many things begin to dwell on their wounds, and often it can, it can be that they also try to control other people just to regain that sort of sense of control of things. So much so that even now in, in Canada and in Europe, uh, they're, they're using suffering as an excuse to even end people's lives, just you know, as a mercy. And this is not the Christian perspective of suffering. It's very easy to take all these miracles that our Lord works throughout his public ministry and, yes, give glory to God, use them to prove his divinity, because only, only God could raise from the dead, only God could give, could give life. But there's always something more, always something more to the story. Why does suffering happen? It's a legit question. The Jews asked it of our Lord in John chapter 8, when there was a, a blind man from birth. And the Jews asked our Lord, who sinned? This person's parents or them? So that this man was, was born blind. And our Lord responded in a manner that kind of baffles everybody. He said, neither his parents nor he sinned so that he would be blind. But rather, this is so that the glory of God may be made manifest. Well, what does he mean? By healing this man who had been born blind, it, it would not only was an event that proved our Lord's divinity, or proved he was a prophet or, or some such thing, but in each and every moment in which our Lord healed somebody, it was a moment in which that person, without having some sort of ailment, whether it be leprosy, whether it be a hemorrhage, whether it be uh, being bent over for 18 years, or whether it someone having died being a widow, never in that person's life would they ever have had such a radical 
moment in the presence of Almighty God with Christ, Christ himself. The biggest miracle in all of these miracles isn't so much that uh, an ailment has been cured, but rather that a normal human being has had a radical moment of contact with God himself, with Christ. In many of our lives, we, we, and we, we practice the faith. We do so kind of more in an abstract sense, thinking of God as something far away from us. But it was precisely in these moments of suffering when humans came the closest possible with Christ. It was precisely in those moments of suffering that these people were gifted the grace of having uh, this pre the Christ present in their lives. Christ present in their lives. The miracle isn't so much that they're cured. It's the fact that these moments of suffering that have gone on for 12, 18 years, decades, <coughs> was precisely the moment in each of these characters' lives where they encountered the incarnate Christ. The miracle wasn't so much that they were healed. It's that they saw God face to face. This was the miracle. This was the opportunity. And it was, it's this moment of compassion. Our Lord became incarnate because of his compassion on us. He had mercy on us, compassion. Uh, in Latin, patior is where the word passion comes from. Patior means to suffer. And, and even in Spanish, uh, the word to share, compartir, comes from, again, patior, the passion. But you add with in front of it, compartir, to, to, to suffer with. This is the root word of, of compassion, to suffer with someone, to share in it. And this is precisely what our Lord did whenever, yeah, he suffered his passion. He shared, in our, he shared in the consequences of sin. He didn't sin himself, but he shared in what ultimately was the consequence of sin, which is death. But he also does so, does so in a very unique way. First, he sees someone. He sees them from afar off. And sometimes uh, the ailment is, is such that they're not even able to see our Lord, whether they be blind or there was a woman in Luke's gospel that was bent over for 18 years. She can't see anybody. She can't, see, she can't look straight. She can't see where she's going. Uh, she can't look to her left or to your right to, to, to see, to have any relationships with anybody. Likewise, the lepers, they were completely and totally excluded from society. All these exterior wounds, all these exterior uh, sicknesses also had a consequence for them spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. There was much more healing to be done than just the physical ailment. And this is precisely what uh, our Lord gives in his compassion to uh, the widow of Nain. First, he looks at her. Then he makes some sort of gesture of going and touching the, this, this, this stretcher. Then he says something, young man, I say to you, arise. And then he simply remains present. Th these are the four ways in which our Lord shares his compassion with us. He can heal people as he did the, the son of the centurion from far off. He has no need of saying to the, the son of the centurion anything, you know, Young man, rise and walk. He has no need of actually touching uh, the young man. All these things have been done uh, without him even, him even being present. He can work these miracles without anything. But nevertheless, our Lord always goes to the extent of, of allowing his mercy, allowing his compassion to pass through his humanity, to pass through his humanity, to pass through his physical body. So likewise, we can learn from this as well of how to have compassion with others that we look them in the eyes. I mean, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the doctor where you know, they come into the, the exam room or something, they look at all your papers, they go through the papers, uh, they see what the problem is, they talk to you a little bit, still looking at the papers, uh, they give you a diagnosis, write out a little prescription, hand it to you, and then just leave. There's a lot to be said about looking in someone, someone else's eyes. There's a lot to be said about looking in someone, someone's eyes. Or another uncomfortable, reason why we don't like, like to look into somebody's eyes. I mean, we've all seen, you know, people soliciting money, you know, uh, you know on the street corner or some such thing. And, you know, they, they come up to cars and ask for money and we just, you know, turn up our radio maybe, or, you know, just look down at our phones or watches or something. Because we know what a gaze does. We know what a gaze does. So our Lord always looks at somebody in the gospel. That's the first thing. The second, allowing, allowing his compassion, his mercy to pass through his humanity, he touches them or even worse, he does something gross. I mean, taking up a, a clay and putting spit in it and reaching out into someone's eyes. I mean, if someone came at me with, with clay they spat in, I'd kind of, you know, back away a little bit. 
Uh, but our Lord always wants to do something concrete, concrete, because compassion is concrete. Compassion isn't simply just an emotion that we say, oh, I have this emotion for you. Oh, I have this emotion. No, it's something concrete that we can do in other people's lives, precisely to be that radical change that, that they absolutely need for all the other things besides the physical ailments, the spiritual, emotional, psychological, so that people know that they're loved. A baby doesn't, doesn't need to read in some sort of book that their mother loves them. All they need is that touch. All they need is to, be, is to be held. And then our Lord has to say something, which he'd always go, you know, for better or for worse. Our Lord says, young man, arise and walk. Sometimes we, we settle too much for just words. And sometimes the words aren't exactly uh, well thought out in the sense that, you know, uh, I knew of a situation where someone had lost, lost a child and people just had, were trying to contr uh, console, of course, the mother, but just saying, oh, our Lord picks all the, be the best flowers, you know, early on or something like that. It's like, I don't know if that, I don't know if that helps. Um, but also remaining, remaining present. And this is probably one of the, the, the hardest thing that humans can do. Because if you, if you remain present with someone who's suffering, Sometimes you feel like that it's a waste of time, that you're not really doing anything. You're not really doing anything. But that's precisely what our, what our Lord has done in simply remaining with us in the Blessed Sacrament. He's here. He's present. Precisely because this is so essential to our human nature. He knows our human nature better than we do. So it's also good in order to practice being compassionate to others, one needs to learn how to sit in silence and feel like it's a waste of time. But it's not a waste of time. And one good way to practice that, obviously, is to sit with our Lord. Because only, only in imitating Him can, are we able to then take the light that we've received from him and to g give it to the world? We ourselves are not the light. We receive that light. We are not the sun. We are moons reflecting somebody else's light. So in this Mass, let us reflect, that, reflect on, the, on the fact that uh, many of us may have a wrong idea of suffering, that it is something to be completely and totally avoided. But rather, our Lord has a completely different idea for suffering, a different completely use for it. And that is to be most present to us precisely in suffering. So don't avoid it. Reread it. Many, many saints have said, if the angels could be jealous of us for two things, uh, they would be jealous of us for two things. One, that we could receive the Blessed Sacrament. And two, that we can suffer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.